Turn it over to you, Mr. Shaw. Oh, I'm presenting for okay. However, uh, you would like to do it. It's up to you. Um, I thought Jonathan would give the um intro since he's in the admissions office. Okay. To start with um the whole process of becoming a student at CCBC. Okay, sounds good. So, Mr. Howie, you are on. Um, again, Jonathan Howie, an admissions counselor from CCBC Essex. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I am Jonathan Howie. I'm an admissions counselor. Um, at the Essex campus. Um, if you're familiar with CCBC at all, um, we have three larger campuses. So Essex, Dundalk, and Catonsville. And then we have three smaller campuses. So um, Randallstown, Owensville, and then we have one, a small building up in Hunt Valley. So we have many campuses, but we're one college. You can take classes at any of those campuses. Now, there are some majors that you might be interested in pursuing that might be at a specific campus. So for instance, if you're interested in pursuing um, automotive tech, they have an automotive bay at Catonsville. They don't have one in Essex or Dundalk. So you, would, you can take a lot of the general courses at anywhere, but when you get into the major of automotive, you'll have to go to um, Catonsville. That's for an example. But we have over 280 different programs at CCBC, credit and non-credit. So if you're interested in getting a, a short-term certificate, maybe you want to be you interested in animals, for instance, you can do something, you can become a veterinary assistant um, and do that with a short-term certificate, non-credit. Maybe you want to be a vet tech. That's our credit side. That's our credit side. That's an associate's degree, become a veterinary tech. So still interested in animals, but you want to get more education. So you would go down the credit pathway and earn more credits to get an associate's degree. But if you ever want to go to our website and see the complete, all of our majors, credit and non-credit, you can go to our catalog from A to Z. Um, whether you're interested in real estate to maybe you want to be a nursing assistant to maybe you want to be a nurse, um, business administration, maybe you want to run your own business. Um, there's so many different options that we have. And we're a two-year college um, and we offer mostly the highest degree that we offer is an associate's degree. Um, now, the first step, and when you think about coming to CCBC, one of the first steps that you want to do is apply, apply to the college. We have, we have free application. You can go onto our website, complete the application, ccbcmd.edu forward slash apply. When you apply, you'll get an ID number. We believe everyone has the right to an education, so we do not put people on waiting list. We do not deny people. We accept everyone. So you apply on the confirmation page, you'll get an ID number. Once you get the ID number, um, you want to start thinking about um, filling out the FAFSA. That's you, Hopefully you guys have filled out the FAFSA already. My seniors, anyone that's a senior, the FAFSA, you would be doing the 20, 2023 2024 FAFSA. Okay, you need to complete the FAFSA um, if you want to be qualified for scholarships, if you want to be qualified for the Pell Grant, um, or the most popular scholarship that we have to offer is called the Baltimore County um, Promise Scholarship. And what the Promise Scholarship says that if a student is a recent graduate from a Baltimore County public school, they have at least a 2.3 unweighted GPA or higher. They become a full-time student when they come to CCBC and their family makes under $150,000 a year. Um, they can get their tuition paid for the entire time they're at CCBC. But when they start off, they'll get their tuition paid for. It's a last dollar scholarship. So if we're trying, the goal is to not graduate in debt. We want to make sure you get the free tuition 
because we're offering a lot of money coming to CCBC. Just because you're a Baltimore County resident, you can come to CCBC tuition free. If you have at least a 2.3 unweighted GPA, it's the Baltimore County Promise Scholarship. And it requires you to do the FAFSA first. So if you're a senior, the FAFSA opened up October 1st. The priority deadline is March 1st. So between October 1st and March 1st, you want to make sure you do um, the FAFSA. And once you um, once you complete the FAFSA, you'll want to complete the Baltimore County Promise Scholarship application. Okay. So yes, FAFSA.gov. You want to make sure if you haven't done the FAFSA, make sure you do it. The priority deadline is March 1st. Now you can do the FAFSA after March 1st, that's fine. However, the Maryland, the state of Maryland, their deadline is March 1st. So if you do the FAFSA after March 1st, you're missing out on money. So you want to make sure you get the FAFSA by March 1st. Mr. Mr. Howie, can I just um, ask, just, I know a lot of parents, hopefully everybody's done, started the FAFSA, but if you haven't, please go to FAFSA.gov and, and help. You, If you're having trouble with that, you should have somebody at your, at your school um, that can probably kind of point you in the right direction. Usually you have like a college counselor or whatever that might be able to answer some questions mm -hmm. as far as it's concerned. Um, but yeah, you're like, thank you, Waymont. Your, your, your counselors at your high school can point you in the right direction because it can be a little tricky. So yeah, it's going to require your parents' tax information. You have to get into communication about what these, it's two years prior. So if you're doing the 23-24 FAFSA, they're going to ask you for your tax returns from 2021. Right. And also keep in mind, your a lot of your schools will be holding FAFSA nights or info sessions. Some have, have been holding a few of them. Some have already held them. Some have yet to held them. Hold them. I would reach out to your, your student's case manager or guidance counselor and ask them when the FAFSA night is going to happen. Um, and it may have already happened at your school, depending on where you are. And if you're interested in coming to CCBC, now the FAFSA is a federal application. So it goes, it, when you complete it, it goes to the federal government. But to let the federal government know that you want to come to CCBC, you have to put our code on there. And our code is 002063. So if you want to put that in the chat. 002063. That's the code for CCBC to let the federal government know where to send your money. And you want to make sure your money comes on time. Um, so when you register for classes, the money will be sitting there right there for you. Uh, Mr. So. Howie, there was one question. Um, a parent asked, what SAT score is required for the Baltimore County College Promise Scholarship? There is none. Is there is none. So if SATs so. are optional. So all you need is at least a 2.3 unweighted GPA for the County Promise Scholarship. Mm -hmm. So it's not a particular. Now, when it comes to the admissions process, so that's the first part. You apply, make sure you fill out the FAFSA so your money's there. Um, but you want to make sure you also submit your high school transcripts to CCBC. We want to see, yes, we accept everyone, but we want to make sure you graduated from high school. We want to make sure your what your GPA, your unweighted GPA is. So if you have at least a 2.5 unweighted GPA or higher, that places you at college level of English and reading. If you have a three point, a final GPA of 3.0 unweighted or higher, that places you at college level in English, reading, and math. If you don't have either of those, then you just take our placement test. And the placement will, test will just determine whether you're college ready or not. Maybe you might need to take a developmental course or not, um, but that's what the GPA does. If you have SAT scores, SAT scores are optional at CCBC, but if you have them and you have at least a 480 or above on the reading writing section, and a 530 or above on the math section, that places you at college level as well. 
If you don't have those, that's okay. You just take the placement test or submit your transcripts. So apply, make sure you do the FAFSA, submit your high school transcripts. Definitely make sure you submit your final high school transcripts to show that you graduated from high school. And then you meet with an advisor and then they can help you register for classes. Um, and that's the enrollment process. Um, and I will turn it over to Mr. Shaw and he can tell you what else you need to do. Or if someone has questions, should I answer questions now, Ms. Schmidt, or should I wait? You can go ahead and um, answer some questions now and then turn things over to uh, Mr. Shaw. But I also just wanted to make it known that in uh, mid-January and early February uh, 2023, there will be presentations like this on a Thursday evening. One will center on the single step program at CCBC and one will center on the LEAP program at CCBC. So keep your eyes out for flyers about that. And maybe Mr. Shaw or Mr. Howie, you can touch upon what those um, programs are like. Um, single step was the first one? Single step and the other program was the LEAP, L-E-A-P program. So I, I guess I just wanted to respond to Janelle Smith. She asked, is the scholarship for full-time students only? Yes. Um, full-time for us um, is 12 credits. So um, that's typically um, four classes. But Mr. Shaw, I don't know if you want to respond to, do they get, can someone go part-time and still be clarified full-time? So that's incorrect if you have if you have six credits or, or or nine credits or lower which is three classes three credit classes and you would be considered part-time anything okay. over nine credits 12 credits or more i'm sorry 12 credits or more is considered to be a full-time student okay so yes yeah. so, yeah, so if you have you have 12 credits or more then you'll be a full-time student looks like we have a question from um latrice moore so is this program the same um, for the um, files program? She she's referring to the um, the secondary placement, the post secondary placement for our students that are certificate track. Yes, the age of twenty one, and um, so that would be. Uh, go ahead, I'll let you CCBC answer. <laughs> They're certificate track. They're not diploma track. But there are programs that um, Ms. Smith was just mentioning, the LEAP and the single step might be more appropriate for those students that are not going for, you know, an AA or to transfer to a four year. Does yes. that help you all get started, Mr. Shaw? I see you're ready That's to correct. jump in. No, that, that is correct. I mean, we do have other programs, other options for individuals who come from a certificate um, background who are not seeking a degree and single step has options for them. Um, there's a, a um, pause program. There are warehouse programs, um, vet tech. Um, I think I mentioned office um, office secretary programs. So there are other options that students can um, participate in if they do not seek to um, to obtain a degree. So, so do they have to fill out the FAFSA? You know, that's a question. That's an interesting question. I've never heard that asked before, Mr. Shaw or, or somebody. I don't know. I don't I've believe. Never had that answer asked. I don't. I don't believe the fast fast for pays for those courses. Um, is that, but I will. I can find that information out and get back to yeah, individual. Yeah. Provide me your information um, before we leave this presentation. I can get back to you on that information. Can, cool. If I could suggest also, if you don't mind my jumping in here. <laughs> Um, if you, that you also talk to your transition facilitator, ma'am, and have you talked to them about the doors program? Does that ring a bell, Ms. Moore? Um, she does have doors. She's, okay. she's actually in doors right now. Perfect. Great. Do talk, do ask doors if they can help with any of the programs we were just mentioning to you about okay. the, okay. And that would, that that's great. Good. That's what I was it, going to suggest. I, I, I've heard in, in 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 past talking with other students that if that is part of the, their goal and their plan from doors. Doors will be that they're a party vendor and pay for those type of courses. 
Bless yeah. you. I, yeah, I get really so, nervous about saying what they were going yeah, to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's exactly what I was thinking, but I didn't yeah, say it. You in, it. <laughs> yeah, it, it, in some cases, they, yeah, they, they definitely will do that. Which is good. But also, it all, it all depends on the plan that's been worked right. out by you and the, and the case manager. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Ms. Moore, they, they, uh, Ms. Moore, do you know who your transition facilitator is? For doors? No, for the school. Uh, what school is it? Dundalk. That would be Greg, wouldn't it? Yeah. Greg Collins. Greg Collins. I, I'll, I'll put, I'm going to yeah, put his, his be... email. I'm going to put his email address in the. Okay. Is that okay? Okay. I would and encourage she, you to reach out. And he can advocate. He can advocate yeah. if his name was on the application mm -hmm. uh, for doors, as long as you know he could help you direct. But um, it's really it's going to be your doors counselor, ma'am, that's going to you know make that decision of whether or not it's a it's a um, course they they look at getting you to work so like mr shaw was mentioning there's classes there's courses that will you know they're they're for jobs and um, that's what they will focus in on but yeah it'll be your doors counselor but yeah talk to mr uh, collins you have lots of support here all right thank you uh-huh and i wanted to say that there was a question from um mary swain howard who asked about do seniors only com um the FAFSA. Yes. Um, you can only receive money from financial aid unless you're a high school graduate. So if you're you're completing the FAFSA, you can only be a high school graduate. Now juniors, we do have something if you're a current junior and you want to take classes in your senior year, if you want to think about that, um, we have something called the Early College Access Program, where students from ninth to 12th can take classes while they're still in high school. CCBC pays for 50% and BCPS pays for the other 50%. So your tuition's covered while you're still in high school if you're a BCPS student. So, because you don't qualify for the FAFSA, so this is a, the way to offset the cost. It also will cover your books. So you don't have to pay for books either if you wanna take classes while you're still in high school. And if I could also jump in again, uh, that's something that they would need to talk to their counselor to also, because it will depend on the um, GPA that that. Well, yes, sir. Um, not necessarily. Oh, so okay. If Things you, change if you, daily. That's why I yeah, don't say too much. There's a lot of changes. <laughs> so the Maryland blueprint, Okay. the Maryland blueprint came. Uh -huh. um, however, if you have a 2.5 unweighted GPA or higher, it places you at college level in English and reading. But right. if you don't have a 2.5, you'll just take the AccuPlace or placement test. Um, and we'll see where you place at. Um, so it doesn't, you don't necessarily have to have a certain GPA. There used to be a time where you had to have at least a 2.5 to participate in the program at all. Okay. So that, or or at right. least get the tuition for free. If you didn't have the 2.5, you couldn't get the tuition free. Now that's, that's changed this year um you can as long as you're a baltimore county public school student um you can get the tuition free okay so See, that, there's even new news oh, for us too thank you uh -huh. so that's um about i'm looking to see if there's any questions um yes if you pay the bcps if you're still in high school BCPS will pay for your books. If you're taking early college access courses, they will pay for your books. The other thing I, I wanted to interject, I saw somebody here that asked if um, this is the process for kids with the IEPs. Only parents and families with IEPs have been invited. So that's who we are today, tonight. So this is directed just for students with IEP. I don't know what the other one's requirements are. <laughs> we just do ours. <laughs> yeah, I, I just invited senior parents of seniors from my schools. I realize now with the code, the code enrollment, I probably should have invited juniors too. I'll, I'll know next time. <laughs> Any other questions about the admissions process that I can answer? I've probably answered a lot of questions. Um, I'll put my email address 
in the chat if you would like. I think there was a question about upper bound. Did someone have a question about upper, upper bound program? I didn't see upper bound. I saw uh, foster youth cost. Yeah, Mary Swain asks if the upper bound program okay. still exists. Okay. And as, as the question, the answer is yes. And I can provide you guys a number if you need it. Um, I guess if someone can write it in the chat, it'd be great. The number is 443-840-4949 if they want to connect with the Upper Bound Program. What is the program called? Upward, upward, upward Bound. Upward Bound, okay. So I can I can turn it over to Michael Shaw. If there's no other questions. If anyone had any questions, I can answer. I'll put my email in the um, in the chat box. Feel free to email me or call me. I'm Jonathan Howie J Howie at ccbcmd.edu, and my phone number is there four four three eight four zero one eight four seven. If you have any questions. Would you be willing to type that into the chat, Mr. Howie? Yeah, I, I typed it in. Okay. I'll, I'll, type it in. I'll type it in again. All right, perfect. Thanks. So, Mr. Shaw, we're turning things over to you, I guess. All righty. Uh, we did a PowerPoint. I hope we didn't overkill. We have a few slides, but we probably won't need to go through all the slides. They're more informational slides, just give information about the office and, and pretty much how DSS runs, basically going through the ADA and Section 504. Um, Ms. Finley came in late. Um, she was able to get in. This is um, the coordinator of the department, Mr. Carl Finley, and she also will be presenting with me tonight too, also. So, Nicole, if you want to share your screen, that'd be great. So just starting off, you know, we, I, we give you an overview of our mission from DSS and just give you an overview of what we do, our mission in the office and and why we do what we do. And, and it all is competence from Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 and the ADA. Um, we go to the next screen. So basically, we, we have to follow the law. And I want to go back one Go back. Sorry. <laughs> we have to follow the law, and then basically the law we we're encompassing two two things that like the Section Five Hundred Four Rehabilitation Act, and also the ADA. And that's basically letting letting you know that we can't discriminate on any individual with a disability, and we're providing access equal access on the post secondary level for any student who has a documented disability. We are following FERPA. It's very important. Um, when we get to the post secondary, um, we have a lot of parents from K through 12 who have been very involved in students and their in their child's um, educational um, path. And we just want to make sure that when it gets to the post secondary, they understand that there's a difference when they they reach to us. When that student signs that registration form, that contract, they are responsible for all activities that happen at that college. And they, in turn, need to release a sign and release that allows anyone else to have access to their records. And, and they stopped at that point. Um, Jonathan mentioned about the blueprint. And we, so we get an influx of students now at an earlier age that we weren't used to at the point. So at first it was 18 that we worried about the FERPA, but we had, we're getting students at a younger and younger age. And it, it just, it ha as, you, as you guys are well aware, this happened all of a sudden. So, you know, these students are now coming to us at an early age. So now we're getting 15, 16 years old taking college classes. So being that being said, these students are still of age that parents can be, have more access to their records. So just getting them to understand that they still, once they sign that contract with CCBC, um, they still have to um, sign, the parents have to come to the office 
bring identification as long as this, uh, also with the student to get permissions for us to, to talk to them about their students records. Okay. okay, so just to touch on some of the differences between how the accommodations are given or seen um, in high school versus how they are in college. So again, the law that we um, follow at CCBC is the Individuals with Disability and Education Act. Um, and this is for students who are enti entitled to accommodations and services while they are in high school versus in college where qualified students who advocate for accommodations are covered by the ADA and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Um, so still show that we have to represent them, still shows that you are covered, but just two different laws that um, covers on each level. So accommodations are determined in high school um, through either IEP or 504. Um, you determine the eligibility, the modifications, and accommodations. In college, a student must self-disclose their disability to the disability service office. So in high school or coming up from K through 12, there was a meeting that involved the parents, the teachers, administrators to decide whatever services and accommodations would be best for the student. And those services and accommodations follow the student throughout until they graduate or until those services are deemed no longer necessary. Whereas in college, it doesn't automatically follow over with you. So once the student is registered and ready to come to college, it's their responsibility or their parent responsibility, depending on the age of the student, to self-disclose that to us, to our department, which is the Disability Services, Disability Support Services Department. And with that, you would bring over your documentation of your disability. And then you'll have a meeting with a counselor to see what accommodations you can be, you can appropriately receive while you're here at CCBC taking classes. So it's a little different. K through 12 follows you straight out, meeting either a parent um, brings a concern to the school or the teacher brings a concern to the school. In a post-secondary college level, the student or the parent, if they completed a FERPA, can bring the, the concern to the school, to our department, and then we'll meet to see what other accommodations um, you might be approved for. Some accommodations might be similar to what you receive in high school, others are not because they're not appropriate. For example, like chunking of your classwork is an accommodation that you will not find on the post-secondary level because they do um, deem you as independent and as an adult. So some things you have to find other ways to, um, to best meet that need yourself. And there's other resources on campus that can help you with that, such as tutoring or the writing center, okay? Um, so again, the process with academic accommodations and modifications are based on the student's specific needs in high school, whereas in college, there is an interactive process where you have to meet with a counselor, again, self-disclose what your disability and concerns are, and provide your um, approved documentation to show um, these concerns that you're having that affects your um, academic process. Oh, sorry. The process in high school, again, is IEP chair or 504 coordinator, meets with the, the teachers, meets with the administrator, meets with the parents, college level, one-on-one, -on -one, or with a parent, with a counselor, and you go over those um, concerns that you have. Okay. Again, implementation in the high school, they're done in the classroom or recess room, resource room um, during school hours. On a college level, some accommodations are implemented in the classroom, such as you have, might have a note taker, a scribe, or interpretation, interpreting services. Um, others can be such as extra time on exams, extra time to complete your assignments, um, having your textbooks in different formats. Um, and sometimes if you need different furnitures, we can also make those accommodations for you here on campus. So in high school, again, through the K through 12, all your teachers and everyone on your IEP team knows about your disability. When you get to college on the post-secondary level, your disability is kept confidential unless you choose to self-disclose that. So um, the DSS memo goes out to faculty and all it lists is your accommodation. So once you come in, meet with a counselor, have your meeting, um, we discuss what appropriate accommodations are available for you and you give us permission 
to share the information with the professors. We then send them an accommodation letter to say, here is Nicole. These are the accommodations that you should provide for her throughout your class for the semester. And that's it. We do not share what your disability is because that is confidential on the college level. Okay. Again, parent involvement in high school, you're involved all the way through because your student is a minor. Um, they're encouraged to participate in the meetings and have discussions on behalf of their student. Whereas on the college label level, again, students are usually 18, but as Mrs. Shaw mentioned, they're now coming in younger between 15 and 16. So we do encourage the FERPA form um, to have access um, to speak on behalf of the student. Um, but once you enter, go ahead. Nicole, can, is it possible you can enlarge the PowerPoint a little bit? Yes. Um, how do I, give me one second. I don't want to duplicate in and everyone has a mirror. I know that some of the families have asked about whether or not they'll be able to have access to this um, presentation. Uh, to be honest, I just took a picture of this one right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Learn this from my students. Yeah, just take pictures. Mm -hmm. I could suggest Wait. that. Well, we're also recording, so we can also send Share a recording uh -huh. of what we're doing. But as far as, um, I, yeah, a lot of them if can, and that's okay. I understand this is proprietary, but it, uh, they're asking if they could have a copy of your slideshow. I, I have no problem with that. We can, we can, we can do a condensed version, or we can. Um, they they want the whole thing, out, and that's fine. But if we, if there's certain things. In particular, they're looking for, especially pertaining to the transition from high school to college slides. I think that I think that's what would be most helpful. But that's that's no problem. I can Thank provide. You, Mr. Shaw. That's very nice. To, of you. to Michael or uh, Jennifer, I'll give it to you guys, and you can disperse Appreciate it. Appreciate that. There, there is another question. I know that again because I've been in the process for quite a while. You know, helping families, and I just wanted to ask this for my own being able to tell my parents. I think it's changed. Um, are you doing it less paper and more communicating with the professors via email and their accommodations? Is that how it's, is that how the, the, the accommodations are being told to the professors? That's what I'm asking. Is it? We, we've always done more electronic as um, far as communication, emails, okay. um, so forth. Um, it's much easier that way that we can have sure. a we can track it that way. We have a record of what's okay. being said, just in case something becomes litigation. We need that with tracking mechanism. So yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Are you able to see the screen bigger? Mr. Shaw, are you able to see the screen bigger? Um, Christine, uh, uh, she's the one that mentioned about this. Um, in large, please enlarge slides. Does it look any larger? Um, Nicole, I think, Nicole, I think it, you need to put it in, put it in from current slide. From current slide. Oh, presentation mode. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, because once I, okay, cause once once I, I do once I slideshow, presentation slide mode, I can't see anyone. I can't see anyone. I'm not sure what you're seeing. Well, I'm going well, again, I'm sorry, we, we will continue with the presentation, but we're going to present the slide to, to Mike and Jennifer, and you'll have a, um, a copy of the slides, so you'll have it for yourself. It's not a problem. Appreciate that. Okay. So just going back to what I started mentioning earlier about the FERPA release, again, we're going back and give you another idea about minors in college and what the rights are for, about the parents. Again, um, students attending the CCBC, um, at any age, the FERPA transfers to the rights of the student. So again, it's their student's record and the student's responsibility if they want to release any records to their parents. They they have that they have the ability to, to say yeah and nay at this point. Um, if the student's enrolled in high school and 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 also the college, the two schools can change information on that student. And even before we get we got into more of this FERPA rules, I remember. Um, the late Mike, uh, Mike Moxie, and we always communicate all the time about students, and it was great. Um, I mean, Mike Bern, um, Brackner also did the same thing. So we, we keep that line of communication open so that if any students need services, you know, we can provide those services in a smooth, a smooth, um, soon, seamless way. Yeah, Mr. Shaw's a good guy to work with. <laughs> uh, maybe not at six o'clock in the evening, but I'm okay. <laughs> next slide. You want to go to the next slide? 
So we're going to go on now talking about um, high school education and how to prepare students with disabilities for college. Next slide. So explaining the accommodation process. Um, now, for a student who now comes to our college, um, our situation is, is we try to make it as seamless as possible. You know, we, we have transition fairs with BCPS um, throughout, we, we, we do it before, before COVID. If we're doing it more Zoom now, which is great, or Teams, or, uh, or as we need now, Google Meet. But we try to have a, a meeting time where parents can come, students can come, and we talk about our services, and we did this for a while in person. Before, before post COVID, and at that time we talked about services, the transition process, where students can get an idea of how the transition process starts from from start to, to end. Um, so to get started with with, with with disability support services, a student does an online application, which is called online intake application. At that time, when the online intake application is done, this we will receive that um, intake application, which is found on our webpage, um, and counselor will, will receive that, review the intake application, along with their documentation, what they embed in the, in the intake application, and then we'll re, um, respond back to that student with for an appointment. That appointment can be either virtual or be face-to-face, -face, and at that time, we will determine reasonable accommodations based on an IEP, final report plan, uh, psych eval, educational assessment, whatever we, we have from the neighboring high school to determine what are reasonable accommodations going forward. Um, we call that meeting interactive process. That way is very important that both parties understand at that point what it is, um, re is reasonable to have on the post-secondary level. Go ahead, Jennifer. I, I'm sorry, I saw in the, um, in the chat that um, they were not able to see the interpreter. So I took myself off screen. I don't know what happened, why we lost her. Is there any way we can remedy that? Oh, you can see now? Because I don't see her. But if you all can, then that's what counts. Okay, I'll go, I'll go away again. <laughs> click on her okay. name and okay, click on the name and click the pin. Did you see that? There we go. Good, good. Sorry. I was just gonna ask too that if um you are not muted if you would please mute yourself just so we can cut back on some of the background noise. Thank you. Okay. So again, as I was mentioned, part of the interactive process, you know, at that time this, the counselor is, is teaching, the, teaching the student, training the student, providing resources for that student about self-advocacy because things are a little different in college. They just need to self-advocate for themselves. Also, um, Talking about resources on campus, um, I think that was might be mentioned a little earlier. Where we talk about, you know, tutoring is not an accommodation in college, so we provide them information about the student success center, about trio programs if they qualify for those, so where they can get maybe one on one tutoring or group tutoring to assist them and help them as a student in college. Um, so just just giving you a little an idea about some of the things that are talked about. And these are some more uh, some more um, the strategies they talked about during that meeting also. So okay. some examples. Go ahead. Some oh um, no, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so just some examples of accommodations that um, your student might be uh, proof for while they're here is um, the use of assistive technology such as Zoom text. And they confuse that all the time with using actual Zoom. It's not Zoom, the program that we're using now. It's actually Zoom text. It's usually used for students who have some type of visual impairment to make the text bigger. So it's an accommodation that they can receive um, during testing, especially the use of the JAWS software, which is a screen reader program and Kurzweil, which is a speech to text program. Um, there's also peer note taker. They receive extended time for exams, whether that's 50% or 100% um, on the high school, it might say time and a half or time times two, two times um, test time, um, reduced distraction for testing. And that can be done either in a reduced distraction space or a reduced distraction room. 
um, the use of an interpreter, books in alternate format, again, maybe in Braille, maybe in PDF, so on and so forth, and then receive copies of the lecture notes or PDF format from the professors. Okay, so this will leave us open for any questions and so we can answer if anyone have any questions for us. If you don't mind, also, if I can jump in from my past experience mm -hmm. with students that have um, had accommodations with their IP and have gone. And the, what I have learned from you all is that <laughs> when you sit down with the student and talk to them about accommodations, if they haven't been using them in the high school setting, it can't be a uh, voila, now you get it. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, um, you know, I've had this discussion with my IEP chairs when I'm working with them about a student getting um, notes or something like that. And if they did not use them in high school, they cannot use them, you know, coming into a, a, a you know, a college setting. You see what I'm saying, everybody? I hope you understand that. that yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> I got a question. Oh, good. Go ahead. Uh, does the program uh, only work in Maryland or can't go or out of state? So out of state, so each college that you go to, you will have to meet with their disability support services um, department and determine what accommodations is appropriate for that school. Oh, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are you. But again, you have to self-disclose and you have to seek that resource on your own. It's not going to automatically just come to you. Okay. Okay. And, and if they, I mean, 99% of colleges are required mm -hmm. to, uh, by law to, to, to offer those accommodations if they accept money from the federal government, yep. then they are bound by ADA. And they, and yep. so every, literally, I'll, I can almost promise you, almost every college you apply to will have something like this. Hey, yeah. Thanks, Mike, for saying, I was going to say, but, no, I'll it, say it, CCD, it, it, the law CCD. says you have to provide access for all individuals with disabilities. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. CCBC does a really good job. So I, I highly recommend you talking to them. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. If there's no other questions, again, Mr. Shaw said we will share the um, some format of the PowerPoint slides with you all so that you can review it on your own. And please reach out to us if you have any questions. You know, but we would like to stress the, the, um, the importance of getting your information to us as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as you may have your last meeting with your transition facilitated with the IEP team, um, by all means, if you know that you are going to attend CCBC, please come see us. We, we, we don't, we don't, we will not turn you away uh, if you get ready to come to us at that time. We can save your information in our database to when you are ready to, to attend CCBC. That way we have your information on file. Um, the most important thing about it is to have your documentation so we can support you when you are ready to attend the college. All right. And I want to make an important point too. So even though you come to CCBC or any other um, establishment you choose to go to. If you currently receive some type of accommodation or services, please follow through when you get to us. And don't wait until the middle of the school year or the term and then to say, oh my goodness, I wasn't getting XYZ accommodation and I want it now. Or, again, we're not going to turn you away. We won't deny you. You will get those accommodations. However, they're not retroactive. So if the school semester starts in September and you come to us in November and you've been late in turning in your assignments or you needed extra time on your testing or you needed a translator, whatever assignments you missed prior to coming with us and getting approved for, you're not going to be covered for those. And a lot of our students fall into that situation where they might be falling behind or not doing so well because they didn't get a, those accommodations from the beginning and are trying to get the help for it now. We will help you to cover you from the day we meet you until the end of the semester, but it does not cover what you miss in the beginning because you didn't choose to disclose to us that you needed those accommodations. Okay. And, and, that's, and we have that issue. We, we, we constantly explain to students that your, your information does not magically show up in CCBC. No. You have to get your information from your, from your, from your college that you, I mean, from your high school that you're currently may be enrolled in by you might be doing dual enrollment or that you may have just graduated we need your information if we don't have that then we cannot assist you going forward we have to have some type of diagnosis documentation to support uh -huh. um, 
any type of accommodation that you are requesting. Right, and you bring it to the Disability Support Services Department, not registrar, not financial aid, because they'll get it, but it's not guaranteed that it'll get to us. So you have to bring it to us yourself. Okay. A question was, what documentation is needed other than the IEP? So like was mentioned earlier, we would like to get the IEP. There should be a neuropsych neuroeducational assessment that was done, or that also could have been an educational assessment that was done was provide us with type of testing that was that was done to determine IQ levels, determine um, learning, give us more information about strategies on your learning, any challenges you, that you might have had in, in, in high school. So it gives us more information to how you how to assist you. But you might you might come to us in a, in this meeting with just a, um, a, a narrow area of what how you think you might learn best. But that information that you're providing us gives us a full assessment of how we can work with you best. One thing also that I think is worth mentioning um, is that your the child or your student has a case manager assigned to them in at the high school setting. They will not have a case manager, somebody who's checking in on them, um, kind of looking over their shoulder, reminding them, hey, this is due, or have you studied for this test? This is where that level of independence for the student comes into play. Um, so hopefully in high school, the case managers are pulling back a little bit, especially with the seniors, to help get them ready for college. Well, yes and no, Mary. Uh, we do have a case management uh, model that we follow in DSS. And the counselors do reach out to students periodically throughout the semester. We do check, we call them temperature checks. So we send emails to the students to tell them about important dates, withdrawal dates, uh, registration dates. Um, have you checked in with me lately? You, um, how are you doing and so forth? So they do understand that they have a point of contact. If there is anything going on they need to talk to us about, we don't want them to get lost completely, you know, it's not completely independence because they still need someone to, sh to help them if, if need be. So we do do these temperature checks. We do promote all the time self-advocacy, you are correct, but it, it's not that one-on-one -on -one support that, that, that some of them are kind of used to. I got a question the other day, we did a presentation to Shepard Pratt the other day, and one of the questions was, is, it not, is a one-on-one -on -one available to be in the classroom with the student in college? And that's, that's a clear note because, again, that's a, that could be a disruption to the classroom. Some students are used to that one-on-one -on -one redirecting behavior issues and so forth. That's not a reasonable accommodation in college. We can have someone coming in the classroom, um, sitting outside, walking in the classroom to redirect a student when they have behavior issues. Students have to, have to behave themselves and, and be abide to the student code of conduct like every other student. So it's very important that students understand, you know, that one-on-one -on -one support. Like you are mentioning, we won't have that here, but we we do our support for them when they do need us because we do do tests check throughout the semester. That, that's very helpful, Mr. Shaw. I was not aware that you had that. You called it temperature control. Well, temperature checks. We we just it's use the word temperature checks. Yeah. Oh, temperature check. And so, how is that done? Is it an email that's sent out to the students and said, you know, globally and said, you know, to asking them if they need any help or is that? Nicole, you want to you want to address that? Yeah. So it is an email that's um, sent out just to check in to see how the student is doing. If they have any concerns, just remember that we're here. You're not here by yourself. Um, also sent during midterms, um, during finals, this reminder that you do have accommodations. Do you need to remind your professors that these are your accommodations that they need to adhere to that you might need to use during testing um, at the when it's coming up towards the end of semester or when it's coming up for time for withdrawal from classes, so on and so forth, so that you know your dates, you're you know, kept abreast of it. Um, but the biggest thing with that is that students need to know that they have to check their CCBC email. It's no longer their personal email because we get that a lot. Also, students say, well, I didn't get anything in my email. We send it to you, but now you're officially a CCBC student. So that's where majority of your communication between us, the school, or even your professors is going to come from. So we do send those out periodically throughout the semester. 
I think one of the questions in the chat, I don't know if I missed it or not, was did your accommodation stay with you the whole four years in college? Once you meet with a counselor, whether it's at CCBC or wherever, and you provide that documentation to that counselor, um, then your whatever is approved from that documentation stays with you throughout your whole stay, whether it's two years or four years, whatever college you go to. Um, unless there's some, some drastic changes in your medical condition that you provide more documentation, then that those can be modified to, to assist you with your new documentation. So that's the, that's the only way things are changed. If, things, if, if your condition changes, then we can modify those accommodations. And Shantis, you asked, even if it was done in middle school, um, are you talking about the IEP? That's a little bit more clarity on that question. She um, said the assessment. The assessment, yes. Yeah. So well, the assessment, just, go ahead, Nicole. Go ahead. So if the assessment was done in middle school, again, we will review the assessment, but as individuals get older, things some things don't change, some diagnoses don't change, but we will review the diagnosis to determine what's reasonable. Again, we look at reasonable accommodations in college. So if some learning challenges may not change. Um, you, you're being taught from K through 12 learning strategies how to assist you with your, with your maybe a learning disability, maybe ADHD, whatever your diagnosis is, you're being taught learning, learning um, learning that you have a learning difference and that there are ways to work around that. So in that case, we will review your documentation to determine what's reasonable. If there's some things you're telling us during our interactive process that we feel that we need additional documentation to support that, then we, then we will ask you for additional documentation to support whatever the things that, that are not on the, the assessment that you're providing us from middle school. We may ask you for additional documentation. If I may interject again, that that's what we were saying, or I was saying earlier today, um, your transition facilitator is your best friend right now, <laughs> because that's what um, I go to my 12th graders and make sure that they have updated testing just today alone because of the pandemic. And this is something our other transition people may have noticed. They were not able to give a full psychological for if they were in the spring, it would have been 2020 and 2021 that they and so that they would not be eligible, some of them until 24 before their next triennial is due. So for, you know, those of us um, that are going to the meetings, we look and see I had to read one today and I went, oh, dear, this doesn't have anything on it. It was just a review and revise. It was and it was from middle school. Actually, I think the last psychological was second grade. So I was able to say right then and there, we need a new psychological, you see? So I'm just saying that that has been happening because of the lapse of time that we were not able to get together with a student, the psychologist, to give them a testing. So and you bring up a great point, Jennifer, because one thing that these, unfortunately these students come to us and they may have missed their, mm -hmm. their last assessment. They're very expensive. That's you know, what on, I tell on, them. On a small level, We've reached out to practitioners, and the least possible when we can provide them maybe twelve hundred dollars. Um, there, there are some places like Lola Clinicals who do it on a sliding scale based on your income. The majority of practitioners who do these assessments range between twelve hundred to twenty five hundred dollars. So if you don't get these things done while you at in K through twelve where it's free, then we can not help you on, on on our level because we're not we're not mandated to do any assessments. At, at, at the college level, whether it's community college or it's at the four-year level. These assessments need to be done before you get to us. Did we miss any other questions? This has been really helpful for yes. me. <laughs> Very informative. <laughs> Any last questions for Mr. Shaw, Ms. Finley, or Mr. Howie? Nicole, um, if you, Nicole, if you don't mind, can you put both our emails in the yeah, chat? So sure. if anybody has any additional questions, um, they might want to ask us, they, they think about at, the, at a later time, they can always email us, and we'd be happy to answer your questions. Again, we're going to provide Jennifer and Mike the, the, um, the PowerPoint, and they can disperse it as needed. 
Yes. So thank you very much for your time and for those of you that attended. Hi, and can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, regarding um, testing, please ask your insurance company if they will cover it. I found a place by asking my insurance company that will cover it for, I just have to do my little copay. And that's great because some will and some will not. So and that's great that you found somebody who will who will cover the insurance. Another question, Amari. Uh, what do you need certain for testing? What? I didn't get. Uh, what do you need insurance for testing? Um, what do you mean by insurance for testing? Well, least, but he was, I, if I, I think I know what you're asking, Amari. We were talking about your um, documentation when you come into a, a college setting. And that, you know, when you go to those meetings and they talk about your levels and all the testing that, you know, every three years you probably had a test being given by a psychologist. Does that ring a bell? Do you realize what they're doing? Yeah. Those are the, oh. those are the tests. That, that's the test we're oh. talking about. Oh yeah! Look at that. See, yeah. Look at that. What 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 nice people we we are is to be giving you this yeah. testy, though expensive. <laughs> right. That's what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. So the insurance would cover um, Amara. Some people who were not tested, if they need to get tested once they get to the mm -hmm. college level, um, some insurances might cover to pay for it for you, so you wouldn't have to pay that nice twelve hundred dollar fee on your own. Right. So I think the, the big point is make sure that that testing is done before you leave high school. The school does it for free. There is no insurance or anything that needs to be checked. You just do that through the IEP team at your school. If you don't know whether you or your student has that assessment done within the last three years, you can ask your case manager or your transition facilitator or the IEP chairperson and they can look for you and let you know. If you do need testing, you would need to start that process probably by about March to get it done in enough time before graduation, because there has to be a meeting first to determine which assessments need to be done, and then the assessments need to be completed, and then you come back to a meeting to review them and talk about how that affects the IEP. And Laura said the great famous Don't word. wait. Don't wait. <laughs> I said, Laura said that famous word. I love that word, free. Yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's important, but don't wait. And don't. I, if I may say, I would not wait until March, right? <laughs> because then the poor psychologist is going to have too many to do, and that's going to be really difficult. So I, I agree, assume. but at least March, because if you don't get that's it by March, it may not happen at all during the school year. Exactly. Right. It'll be too late. You have to have it before you leave in May. I think it's worth saying, too, that just like so many of the positions in the school systems right now, there are schools without psychologists. I was in an IEP meeting this morning um, with a school without a psychologist, and the team just asked the parent to re-sign a permission for assessment, you know, to continue to give them some time in order to get a contractual psychologist to do it. So, um, you know, there are ways to get them done. It may not be in the traditional timeline, but, you know, the county will work with you that way. Can I ask a question? Is it any way possible that for a student's last IEP meeting, they can be mandated to be present in that meeting so they know everything is happening? A lot of times students we ask don't. Them. We ask them every time to come. That's Well, you just you said ask. Yeah, but, well, you can't, you know, you pull them out of the air it. and get them to come, but <laughs> we do our so There's no way possible best. to mandate them to attend the last Yeah, night. the mandating's a strong word. Okay. I wish we could, but I hear you. We we do we do uh, strongly encourage it. We try to pull them in. And they're usually pretty receptive um, when it comes to when they're leaving. They don't mind coming to see us when they're leaving. During in between, it's a little bit more difficult, but I hear you. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah, when we have our conversation, a lot of time they're clueless. A lot about the things they on the, on, the, on the IP or psyche valve. They don't know anything that's on that paper. Maybe not even know a diagnosis. They didn't know what. So we just. I 
we had just, that conversation just a few weeks ago with the parents that did not understand why their child had an IEP. They are also English was a second language, which brings me to a question. Do you, Nick Doors, I've been able to get, you know, uh, interpreters. Do you have any ability to have interpreters at any point in registration or anything for families? Is that possible? We will, we will provide um, for directions, instructions, interpreters needed when student comes in to admissions, um, but they have to make appointments. We don't do it on a drop-in basis. As long as they make an appointment, we can provide them an interpreter. Oh, when they great. Come to the process. Um, Mr. Shaw, I've learned so much. Keep going. <laughs> but we do have devices in the office to assist them or hands-on. Um, you know, it's some of the text message type of device we can use. Um, but other than that, there are no interpreters on staff right now that can assist them um, as a drop-in basis. But we, do, we can make those appointments. Good to know. Thank you. All right, so I think it's it's seven oh four. It's probably a good time to close the meeting down. Um, as Mr. Shaw has said, he will send the PowerPoint to either Mr. Bracknell or to Miss Waymont, who will then distribute it to the other high school transition facilitators. And um, the high the high school transition facilitators will also have um, the recording made available to them should a parent want it. They just need to ask the transition facilitator for it. Okay. Did we? I, I know there were any questions asked before the meeting, but I just want to make sure we covered everything. Was there anything pertinent that you guys needed to know at this point that we can answer before we finalize this? I guess we touched on everything, I'm assuming. We gave a lot of amazing <laughs> information. Okay, just wanted to make yes. sure. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for participating and for all the information that you provided. Thank you. Um, I do have a question. Uh, the temperature check emails. I was asking um, if there's a FERPA on file for the parent, will you copy the parent on that email as well? For the temperature, <laughs> for the temperature checks, it's just basically outreach, okay? Um, no. We, those go right directly to the student's email. The student has, has the ability to share that email with their parent if their parent they feel that parent needs to be involved at that point just to let them it's just basically an email to see how they're doing at the current time about the important dates coming up uh they need to see them they can email them email the council back just to touch bases to see how they're doing and to make sure they are um, and they had any additional questions or concerns they can reach out to their council right uh, something i do with my own child is i just have access to their login information um if I feel like they don't share the information with me, and you did sign the FERPA, so <laughs> it's like I'm having, just saying. Yeah, you know, it's like having friends that I know that have you know family members that are doctors or nurses. Kids mm -hmm. can't get away with saying they're sick <laughs> when they're not. <laughs> and so I see somebody in education. You can't get by somebody. <laughs> and, and just good just, advice. So I like that. But and just to be upfront, instructors don't have to speak to parents. Even though it's a FERPA on file, instructors don't have to speak to a parent. They don't have to. Um, the FERPA basically is, is, is a way that a parent can get access to their records if they need to, but instructors not mandated to talk to, to a parent. Anybody so the, document, else? the document is just for accessing grades? Um, rec rec grades, um, records, if there anything that they need to share from the admissions office that was, that, that, um, that's on file right now. So there, if there is a purple on file and you call to say, Hey, um, I want to speak to an academic advisor. I just want to, um, have questions about my, 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 my child's, um, current grades. Then they can, then back in the provider can give you an idea of what's going on at that point. Um, but again, if an instructor feels they can, they, they, they don't want to talk in more detail about what's going on in the classroom, they're not obligated to, they can give you a, a very vague conversation. Okay. No, I understand. I think um, we've built up, but I just like to have fail safes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, you know, having a young man, um, it's, you know, a little, 
you know, they're quiet and, um, you know, they, you have to pull teeth basically. But um, I think we're on a good um, track and I probably won't need, I'll have it on file, but won't need it. But I thank you all for your information. And, just, um, just to give time. you a heads up, like any other school, we have a learning management system. We currently use Brightspace. And with Brightspace, most instruction has have grade books in there. And just like Ms. Friendly said, if you and your child have a good um, open relationship, um, like I said, it's pulling teeth sometimes, but you know, you just have access to their their username and password. You can go in there and check the grade book just to make sure they're doing okay. Right. Anybody else? Right. Well, we hope that some of you will be back to join us next week for the presentation that's on career link. So you should be looking for information coming from your transition facilitators about that. So thank you again so much and um, have a wonderful rest of your week. All right. Good seeing you again, Mike. Good seeing you too, Mr. Shaw. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, you too. We're just starting to know each other. <laughs> Now you know. <laughs> and now I know. See, I will see you. Good Take to see you. Take care now. I'll email Bye. you guys soon. I'm mean, tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> see you. <Okay. laughs>